the um, if you go down to paragraph 12, let me make sure that's still of part two. I think it probably is. Actually, it's part one. I mean, it's Roman numeral one, I guess. It's, oh. Well, anyway, so uh, Roman numeral one down to paragraph 12. And when he's asking what's implied in the question, is thy heart right with God? And he's gone through uh, a list of various things in paragraph or section 12, second paragraph. Dost thou believe that God now upholdeth all things by the word of his power and that he governs even the most minute, even the most noxious to his own glory and the good of them that love him? And then the next sentence is the one I really want to highlight. Hast thou a divine evidence, a supernatural conviction of the things of God? Um, this is a really important aspect of Wesley's teaching, this divine evidence or supernatural conviction. Um, for him, faith is actually a kind of divine evidence that God gives. And so it's not just me like believing certain things to be the case, but my having received a, a, at least a measure of certainty from God. Um, sometimes, often he calls this the witness of the Spirit or the witness of the Holy Spirit or testimony of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this is also referred to as the doctrine of assurance. It all fits under the category of experience really well. And it's one of the reasons why Albert Outler, to whom we referred last week, the Methodist theologian who coined the phrase, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Um, I don't know how that sentence started. That ended up being a long sentence, but the main idea is that Outler um, argued that Wesley's emphasis on experience like this, this kind of experience. Hast thou a divine evidence, a supernatural conviction of the things of God? And in fact, this emphasis was quite controversial in his own time, for sure, um, in uh, 18th century Church of England circles, where uh, there was a much heavier uh, appreciation of reason and some... Uh, nervousness about experience, especially when the experiences seem to be a bit on the extreme side. Um, such experiences or claims like hearing voices or having visions, or even having your heart feel strangely warmed by the Holy Spirit, were often called enthusiasm. And as Presbyterian theologian William Plaker once famously wrote, in the 18th century, enthusiasm was a dirty word. And uh, so Wesley got accused of being an enthusiast because of questions like this. Do you have a divine evidence, a supernatural conviction? Or as it says in the very next paragraph, dost thou believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now that's one thing, right? God, God overall, blessed forever. Uh, that being a quotation from the book of Romans. But it's that next line, is he revealed in thy soul? See, so for Wesley, belief is never really truly belief or not belief fully um, realized unless and until that which you believe in is revealed in thy soul. So again, this is also basically his doctrine of assurance. I just wanted to highlight those little points there where Wesley, not untypically, is, is sort of slipping in um, to his sermon what became for him a, a really important touch point, this whole idea of assurance. Um, now, it was controversial then. It remains somewhat controversial today. Again, insofar as once people start appealing to their experience or experiences, you're sort of on you know, it's a bit shaky ground, like, you know, how do we test these experiences? And, and Wesley did offer uh, some of that. 
um, some tests, but we'll get to that sort of thing later. Under section two, I really like this. Section 2.1, um, if it be, give, thee, give me thy hand. I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not. I do not expect or desire it. Gee whiz, I pretty much desire it. <laughs> I just think the world would be so much better if more people agreed with me. So, and I think Wesley actually thought that too of himself. So, but you know, in a sermon printed, you want to have the right words there. I don't expect you to be of my opinion. I don't desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. I cannot. It does not depend on my choice. Interesting idea here, right? You don't will yourself to certain opinions, he says. I can, and I love, I've always loved this line, I can no more think than I can see or hear as I will. I don't choose, well, to some extent we do, don't we, uh, to see what we see and to hear what we hear. I think Wesley's sort of underselling the extent to which our own prejudices, desires, uh, commitments actually do play into what we see and hear. Uh, nonetheless, I like the notion that he's saying, you know, the way that a person thinks is not exactly under their full, you know, my opinions often strike me from outside, just like I look at the world as objects outside of me, and I don't sort of create my own reality or my own, you know, the world isn't simply my opinions. Um, anyway, keep you your opinion, I'll keep mine, and that as steadily as ever. You need not even endeavor to come over to me or bring me over to you. I don't desire you to dispute those points. And again, now these are points that he would say are relatively, uh, uh, again, um, incidental importance. Let all opinions alone on one side and the other only give me thine hand. But, you know, he's already told us and will probably tell us again, that doesn't mean anything goes, right? Different worship styles, fine. Um, I love, you know, dip, dipping or sprinkling in baptism or if, even if you're not even sure... You believe in baptism, you know? And um, so finally, we get near the end. Well, what does it mean if I say, give me your hand? Paragraph three. I mean, first, just love me. And not only as you love everybody, like back there to paragraph one, not just like you love your neighbor, not only as you love your enemies, or those who hate you, and so on and so forth. I'm not satisfied that you love me at that level. I, love, I want you to love me with a very tender affection. I, I know that um, both Gabriel and Al have read this sermon before in another class. I believe it was Al particularly who took him to task a little bit for for these, uh, these pleas for love. That, well, you know, next paragraph, love me. Love me with the love that is long-suffering and kind, a love that is patient. If I am ignorant or out of the way, if you think that I'm mistaken in some sense, bearing and not increasing my burden, uh, love me, you know, in a tend and tender and soft and compassionate way. Um, I actually like it because there's sort of this humility here that, that, you know, love me in a way that really I need to be loved. Um... And so this is what he says Catholic spirit is, that kind of love. Not indifference to uh, public worship and so on. So, but you can read the whole thing. And I'm, But I am going to end with that last paragraph with which I have a little footnote. You, oh, human of God, man or woman of God, think on these things. If you're already on this path, you know, in this way or on this path of this kind of Deep, deep love, keep on. If you have heretofore mistook this path, bless God who has brought you back to this path through my sermon. And now run the race that is set before you in the royal way of universal love. Love for all. Take heed. 
lest thou be either wavering in thy judgment or straightened in thy bowels. That is, be careful that you don't waver from this instruction or allow your compassion or empathy to be, you know, tightly constrained. That's what it means to be straightened in your bowels, in case you were wondering. But keep an even pace, you know, just keep on, keep on, on keep it on. Rooted in the faith once delivered to the saints and grounded in love, in true universal or Catholic love, until the day that you are swallowed up in love forever and ever. Amen. Catholic spirit. Well, be sure to um, uh, submit your notes on, uh, I think I asked you to do that. Yeah, and then um, on these little mini lectures, put something down. And then um, be sure to reply to this um, with your own, you know, what we usually do in the Zoom room, accountability sweep. You, you, you know the drill. Uh, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to assume that I'll see you all Wednesday, 8.15. Again, I apologize for um, our, um, there's a word I want to use, postponing that auspicious date till Wednesday. Blessings to you today.